Welcome everyone to the spring NAMA Culinary Arts Committee webinar. And we are going to be talking today about morels. And our guests today, uh, we have Spike Mikulski. Hello. Hi. We have Wade Fox. And Dr. Gordon Walker as our guest today. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce each of our guests here. Uh, I am Jess Starwood. I know I see on my little name tag here, it says Trent Blizzard, who is the president of NAMA, but um, I'm using his account. But um, I'm a member of the culinary committee and I will be the host for tonight. Uh, so Spike, um, let's see. Spike is the executive chef at. Uh, how do you say the? Uh... Nobody, nobody can pronounce it right. And it's funny the the street that I'm on, nobody can pronounce any of the names of the restaurants. French was not my my it, uh, it, language. It, <laughs> it's French for fire pot is what it is, and it's a classical home cooked boiled dish that um you know you, you go to your family's house on Sunday. And that's what the restaurant's named after. Okay, yeah. So that's in Providence, Rhode Island, where he gets to prepare and serve foraged ingredients you can't find in any other menu in New England. Spike is Rhode Island's first mushroom forager approved by the state to sell wild mushrooms commercially. And he teaches the state certification program once a year for those who are interested in foraging mushrooms for local restaurants and markets. During the rainy season, Spike enjoys studying the Amanita, Amanita, Amanitaceae, sorry, <laughs> some of which make up his top 10 edibles. Unfortunately for Rhode Island, there are no Amanita approved for sale, so you will not find them on the menu at the restaurant. Uh, he does, however, get to utilize his experience as an Amanita expert in North East specialist for the Poisons Help Emergency Identification for Mushrooms in Plants Facebook group as an identifier. In the off season, he has taken a fascination to learning food molds and plant pathogens commonly seen in the modern kitchen, observing occurrences like sour rot on sweet potato caused by Geotrichum candidum which is utilized in cheese making or garlic bulbs being parasitized by penicillin <laughs> known for its antibiotic properties. Spike has a few of his dishes featured on Instagram at 1WD2. <laughs> It's it's a big long string like, of numbers. You want to post that on the bottom of the screen? Yeah, that's my email account from when I was sixteen, and yes, I still use it. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, he also has some educational Amanita identification videos on his YouTube channel. So that is Spike. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, and next we have Wade. Wade Fox owns and operates a maximum nutrient bioavailability food lab named the Fermented Forest. He specializes in koji fermentation and permaculture, but is fluid with most other types of fermentation as well. He has 20 years of foraging experience and 10 years working with koji. Current projects are dry aged truffles for a collaboration with OESA Labs, a solvent alcohol-free extraction process focusing on cordyceps and other adaptogenic medicinal mushrooms. He is excited to be part of the NAMA Culinary Arts Committee and to meet as many people as possible from the MICO community. Welcome, Wade. And last but obviously not least, we have Dr. Gordon Walker. Originally from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Dr. Gordon Walker moved to California to attend UC Santa Cruz, where he developed a passion for scuba diving and home brewing. His interest in yeast and fermentation led him to a graduate program at UC Davis, where his doctoral research focused on the yeast sac Saccharomyces cerevisiae. 
in wine production. After achieving his PhD, Gordon spent his time spent time in New Zealand where he rekindled a childhood interest in mushrooms and began posting pictures of his finds to social media as fascinated by fungi. He now shares his passion for fungi and fermentation with over 2.5 million followers worldwide. Welcome, Gordon. All right, so with that, um, Gordon, would you uh, introduce um, our topic tonight? We're talking about morels. Sure. So we're talking about morel mushrooms. Here's my cute little figure that I'm going to use to sort of illustrate them. Um, morels, some people think that morels are not mushrooms, uh, and that's because they're part of Ascomycota. So there's two big types of mushrooms out there. There's Basidiomycota, which is all of like the boletes, the polypores, the cap and stem mushrooms, you know. And then all the weirdo stuff usually is an Ascomycota. So we have morels, cordyceps, uh, a lot of truffles, um, actually a lot of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which you mentioned, um, koji, aspergillus, a lot of the fungi that are not necessarily mushrooms are also part of Ascomycota. But morels are some of the most like recognizable things that I would still consider a mushroom that are in Ascomycota. Uh, a lot of people get confused because this time of year, you'll see a lot of people referencing stuff called false morels. So I just really want to clearly state that a true morel uh, is going to have these deep pits in the cap, kind of a honeycomb structure. They'll usually be conical uh, and it won't have like a folded cap and it's also going to be hollow inside. And that's a Morchella species. Morchella is a true morel. The other things that people call false morels aren't, none of them are what I would call a false morel. There's verpa, sometimes called a thimble morel, and those have sort of a white pithy inside and the caps aren't usually attached to the stem. Uh, there's helvella, which is elfin saddles, and those are really cool looking, but they really don't look like morels. They're like white or black. They're not sort of easy to confuse with morel and they more fluted stems. And then there's gyromitra, which are the ones that are like seriously toxic. But there's also confusion there because there's some gyromitra like Carolina or Montana or, or Gigas, there's like different species that are sort of larger and lighter brown. And those you can eat if you just cook them normally in a pan. But like Esculenta and Fula are some species that are much darker brown, usually in more sort of like folded and vaginated um, and really brittle. And those are deadly toxic if you consume them. Uh, morels also should always be well cooked because a raw morel can actually be deadly toxic. And they found that out last summer. There was a, a rash of poisons that happened in uh, Montana, I believe, where there's some sushi places that were like marinating morels in soy sauce, but then not actually cooking them. And we don't know whether it was like the raw morel or like the bacteria that might have grown on them because it could have been listeria, but some sort of like effect happened there. But morels are not a mushroom you need to be afraid of. They're wonderful. They're delicious. Um, they have a very complicated life cycle. And that's one that's like kind of still being uncovered but they live as what are called endophytes inside of trees. So they're kind of like uh, in their, what's called the anamorphic or haploid state. They're the state that they're not gonna form a mushroom in. They're actually living basically as like a mold inside of the tree. And imagine the tree is like a building and the morel is like a tenant in the building. Um, it forms what's called a sclerotia. It's kind of like a big like potato tubery thing on the roots of that host tree. And if the tree dies from like wildfire or disease, that sclerotia will then create a mycelial mat and goes out and then overwinters. Um, and in the spring, that mycelial mat like activates, mates, sucks up all the surrounding nitrogen and starts popping out morel mushrooms. And so one of the things that people misunderstand with morels is they think that if you like harvest all of them, they won't come back. Well, morels are only coming out generally when there's a, been a big disturbance. So whether or not you harvest them, they're gonna be like exponentially less every year. Um, this is not to say that you should go out and harvest every morel you see. It's still good to practice like, you know, harvesting foraging ethics. You really should only take about, you know, half to maybe two thirds of what you find, leave really young ones, leave really old ones, you know, only take what you need kind of thing. I, I occasionally see those posts where people have like, you know, million pounds of morels and you're like, you know, you probably could have left some of those in the woods. Um, but also like we try not to pick shame people. And so we encourage people to, you know, educate and learn and talk about their practices um, instead of just starting, oh, you took too much because you don't know where they're foraging. You don't know the, the nature of the land, the nature of disease, all this kind of stuff. Um, in North America, there's something like, I don't know, over 30 Morcella species. There's a lot of them, but generally they fall within three classes. There's black morels, blonde morels, and what are called like landscape morels, basically. So black morels tend to be more common with burns out here on the West Coast. Blonde morels tend to be more common with like ash and elm and different tree species across the Midwest and the East Coast. Um, the landscape morels will pop up literally anywhere in like woodchip beds. 
at almost any time of year because they kind of care less. But most of these other morels are going to pop up usually in the spring when the soil is between about 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and in a lot of places, that's only like one or two weeks of time. So that makes morel season very short. If you have somewhere where there's uh, mountains, you can track morel season up the mountain as things start to thaw out. So here in California, our morel season can run basically from like the end of March all the way through like the middle of July. Um, as long as you go up in elevation, you're tracking the snow line. Um, in some places, though, it's it's really tricky and you have to like absolutely nail that like one or two week period. And so there's some people who keep very close eye on the weather and like you need to have certain numbers of like days of cold, certain days of warmth. Uh, and then you want to be looking for particular tree species. And I know like across of much of the U.S., um, ash and elm trees are ones that have a lot of morels associated with them, but that's partially because ash and elm trees are both dying from these sort of like massive tree genocide like diseases. And so morels do associate with a lot of different tree types, but specifically the trees that are dying and big mature older trees tend to be the ones that have more morels associated with them because that sclerosis had more time to, to grow. Um, so some people may you know, disagree with some of the things I've said, but this is sort of what I've been able to figure out about the most recent stuff that we know about morels. They're also very difficult to cultivate because some people have figured out in China, some people have figured out in Copenhagen, and the general theory there is you have to put them on very nutrient poor soil, let them grow through that, find a source of nutrient, and then come back through the nutrient poor soil and they form sclerotia. Once the sclerotia have formed, that's when you can get them to like form fruiting bodies. So that's all part of the reason why it's like very difficult to cultivate them. And if you ever see someone selling morel seeds, they're a scammer. Ignore them. So that's that's most of what I have to say. Also, yeah, cook them well. But we're going to show you how to do that. Yeah, thank you so much, Gordon, for introducing that. And you, as always, are a wealth of knowledge. Um, and so we're actually going to head over to Wade, who is going to be cooking live for us today. Um, what morels are you going to be cooking today? Um, I think they are burr morels because uh, friends of mine sent them to me. They, they have a specialty company and they sent me some. Uh, sent me a lot of them and I should take them from the black morel. Uh, so, um, and this recipe is actually better for the dry, but um, I'm doing shio koji and koji is a uh, mold used to make things like miso or soy sauce or uh, sake, etc. And um, we're going to learn how to do shio koji, which just means salt koji. It's kind of like a liquid marinade over there, but it's kind of like their liquid salt. Um, it's used as a marinade, salt substitute, um, used to cure meat. Um, what else? What else? Uh, Wade, I'm, I'm hearing or I'm seeing some people commenting that um, they're having a hard time hearing you. Um, it kind of your audio kind of comes in and out a little bit. I'm not sure what we can do about that. Is that better? A little muted. It seems like it's kind of when you're. Um, I don't know if it seems like earbuds. Might be. I can try without them. Uh, um, change the microphone to the laptop. Try yeah. That. Yeah. If you want to try just going directly to your phone. Are you on your phone? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to try that without the microphone. Yeah. Just face the microphone a little easier. Is that better? We'll give it a try. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, like shio koji, it's super easy to make. Uh, it it's something that needs to sit on the the counter for ten days. Um, is that better? Uh, it still seems to be in and out for some reason. But we'll just keep going. We'll go with oh. it. Oh. Is that better? Much better. Yeah. Much better. Ugh. So um, shio koji is just uh, dried rice koji and water and uh, salt. And it just it's going to sit on the, the counter for 10 days. And in that period, it goes like uh, 
basically the rice koji, it's like full of uh, enzymes. And for this process, most notably amylase. And so um, there will be a secondary lacto-fermentation because of the addition of the salt. But um, ultimately what's happening is the salt is kind of slowing down the enzyme's ability to rip through the medium. So um, uh, the end result is something that um, adds a ton of like umami, ton of flavor. Like it's like, I'll put some on some meat just to kind of show people like one of its uses where you can hyper accelerate curing meat in your fridge. Like you could do what is similar to like a 30 day dry age in like 12 hours, which is crazy. Um, wow. And like when you cook the meat, it'll be more tender. You get a better caramelization around the cap um the flavor is like the higher the quality of the meat the better flavor you're going to get out of it um what else what else i like three or four years ago I, I got my parents to start using koji for their meat and now when they go to other people's houses they'll say like um you know that the dinner was great but it wasn't koji so I created these like terrible food snobs um but yeah it's like your your meat is then pre-pro postbiotic like you're just getting like maximum nutrient density out of your food and um but yeah so uh where okay so this is dried rice koji and um i bought this from uh rhapsody natural foods um they're out of vermont i think in cabot cabo whatever vermont and um i've used their stuff for 10 years and it's hype like super consistent um you, you can obviously make your own but um i just really enjoy using the dried medium because i can like take it on backpack trips or you know, it's like more functional for me so this is um in a bowl, we've got 300 milliliters of water. And then we add 30 grams of salt. And you're going to mix that up until it dissolves. And then you'll add 100 grams of rice koji and stir that until it becomes almost like porridge and that's all it is you just like put this in a jar close it let it sit at room temp for 10 days and at the end of that it's like this like crazy sweet aromatic like it it, it kind of brings fruity scents out of the rice um and then another thing to do like if you don't want to do um like any of that if that's like too much um you can do we got like a 10 ounce jar of tamari and um Hundred grams of the dried rice koji, because like effectively the uh, the tamari is the water and the salt, so it's like there's no chance that it's gonna like go bad. Um, like that's the preservative, and then just mix this together, and this is a marinade flavor powerhouse. Um, like literally add this to everything. Um, I've added it to brownies, I've added it to, like all all the meat marinades. Um, and then this is also something easy that like, you know, for the morel, just add however many you want, fresh or dried. And it adds like more of that like glutamate, like that umami to the to the medium. So uh so yeah, and like this this is ready kind of like when the morels 
absorb the liquid, but it's like pretty much good to go. And like one of the cool parts about this is that morels, like when you use Koji with morels, it has this like dark chocolate flavor that like is pulled out of them. So now you have like dark chocolate tamari. And like this is really great, like when it's finished to add to um tomato sauces or pizza sauce or uh salad dressings. Um but I did a uh just to show y'all like what Chio Koji looks like when it's ready. Um this is you know after the 10 days and I blended the rice and water together and then added some morels and yeah it's just a super easy hyper functional um you know and this will last in the fridge for at least six months and then this will last in the fridge kind of indefinitely because the soy sauce has a pretty high content of salt in it anyway um so yeah th these are two ways to use koji that are hyper versatile um, you know, you don't have to add morels to it. Like you can add, you, you can use it just as it is. Um, but like every spring I kind of do menu math. And this is like um, one of the things I look forward to every year. Um, but then uh, someone just asked if I cook the morels. I do like, uh, and I'll, I'll show you all that later. Um, I did a dish. So um, this is uh, that that's been strained. And um, so this is like that morel shoyu koji that I like use to cure ramps. And I'm going to um, use this to marinate some white asparagus and carrots. And then I forage some um, garlic mustard. So it's like just marin I'll marinate it for you know 10 minutes or whatever as a um uh, you know, kind of like a, a spring primavera um but yeah so that's kind of like that sounds amazing wade um i i see a question from jan and graham walker here saying uh how do you use this with meat oh okay so um I got some flank steak and this flank steak's a really great cut to use because it's you know relatively inexpensive and still you know, it's not like eating a tire. Um <laughs> and so you'll take I guess this is maybe four ounces ish. Uh and then get your morel shiokoji. Just like let it, you know, give it a, a just make sure it covers or it mm -hmm. coats it fully. And then um, saran wrap or whatever, and put this in the fridge for 12 hours. And it'll be like the best flank steak you'll ever have every time. Literally, like, yeah, like Koji, a lot, a lot of it's there's a lot of information out there but the information's not really full information they kind of like tell you a portion of something but it's almost like a game of telephone like a really irritating game of telephone and the way you like you learn all the rest is by using it and figuring out like what you like about it and what you dislike and just kind of like making it work for you and your space but mm -hmm. um like when I started using it, there wasn't, there weren't any books in English and it was either like in Japanese, which I don't speak or like scientific gibberish. And, um, so it was just kind of like trial and error. So like I, I do, I do things a lot differently than the traditional processes, but that's just kind of what works for my space. So like I, I, do a shio koji with koji flour as opposed to the whole grains and it takes me 24 hours for it to hit 
for it to be usable instead of 10 days. So it's just really like there, there's ways around um, like if you don't want to wait, um, there's absolutely like any possible way to use it that you want to use it. Um, it. Again, it's just figuring out like what works for your own uh, commitment and your, your space. Awesome. That's awesome, Wade. Um, we have a couple questions over here, and then I think we're going to scooch over to um, a couple videos from Gordon. Um, let's see. So Jessica asks, do you have any other mushrooms you prefer with the koji? Um, let me see if I can put this on. Uh... What's it called? I'm trying to figure out if I could put it on like speakerphone. Hmm. Uh, the source of the rice koji that I use, it's Rhapsody, R-H-A-P-S-O-D-Y, Natural Foods. And it's a great, great company. Um, very consistent quality. They also sell like natto and white miso and red miso and um really just uh and if you want to buy bulk they sell like 15 pound bags um like if you don't want to just buy like a pound at a time um it's like the cheapest best quality consistent quality that i've ever found in america um right. but other mushrooms um I mean, like other things that, so you could take this and add it to honey and um, it will make the honey separate over time, kind of like a miso where a portion of it will, will become more liquid and then the rest will crystallize. And it just, you, it's a way to like maximize like preservation for the long haul. Um, because it's like as sterile as a natural environment out there. And, uh, but I, I like doing uh, uh, fresh chanterelle. You can make sort of like a meat variation. Um, what else? Uh, truffles, good Lord. Um, I do like koji truffle honey, um, truffle shio koji. Um, it's a great, like, you know, truffles are expensive. So you can take, you get an ounce, you spend 30 bucks and get an ounce of truffle and make a quart of truffle shio koji. And that expands, that basically makes the the expenditure not exist. Because, um, you know, th then you have a, a quart, which will last you. I mean, a quart of truffle shio koji will last me, you know, five, six months. Mm -hmm. Um uh, 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 matsutake works. Um, I've only used dried. I've never had fresh matsutake. Um, the porcini is amazing. Um, yeah, really just anything. Um... That's great. I, I think that sounds really versatile and you can use whatever you've got going on in your, your area or season. Um, let's take a break. Uh, we have a few more questions here, but we are going to come right back to them. Um, I wanted to switch over to Gordon has a couple brief, um, videos. Uh, the could, first could, one, could I say one or two oh, things before we absolutely. go, just while we're still on the top of Koji, I saw someone ask like, how do you make Koji? So if you, the easiest thing is to go to an Asian market and buy Shio Koji as, you know, in a little container. Um, if you don't have access to an Asian market, you can't find that for some reason. You can order like dried granules of koji online. So that's Aspergillus oryzae. That's the the fungus that is koji, basically. Um, and then once you have mixed that into some rice and you let it sit there for a few days, you get that sort of like, and then I think you blend it usually to make the shio koji with some salt. Um, and then you can rub that all over veggie steaks or, or do what Wade was showing you guys to do. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that if you're if you're working with like dried mushrooms, it's probably OK. Uh, you wouldn't want to do this like a fresh morel. You'd want to cook it first. Um, a dried morel, you're blowing off the volatile um, part of it that would be toxic. 
So it's just like a quick safety thing. Okay, we, we can go ahead and uh, play a morel video. Which one do you want to start with? The morel cream sauce video? The or um the uh, uh sog paneer Indian spinach one might be good. Um, but I, I, anyone who's going to watch this, I warn you, this may trigger you. If your favorite well, way to cook morels is just to like fry them in, you know, put them, batter them in flour and fry them in butter, this is a different way. But, but go ahead and show that one. All right, we are. I have my wonderful assistant Mike here helping me out. Um, so with our technology here, and here we go. Uh, let me make sure the sound is on there actually. These are all on my Instagram, my YouTube, if you want to watch them later. I also have some longer cook, cooking streams and stuff like that with morels, but these are just short little videos. Time how I cook them. First, you got to find them out in nature because they can't be cultivated easily. You got to bring them home and clean them. And I like to soak them a couple times in changes of water to get all the grit and bugs and ash out of them so they're not crunchy when you eat them. And then I cook them down in a dry pan, cook up all the water. Here I cooked them up with some onions and spices, kind of a garam masala turmeric mixture. And I'm going to make a sog paneer, kind of Indian style spinach with morels and some fried cheese and then a little bit of milk to bring the whole thing together and thicken it up with some more spices there. A little bit of sour cream for some tang because I didn't have any yogurt. I threw in my fried cheese and stirred it all together. Served it up with a little bit of mango pickle and some chutney on paratha absolutely delicious you guys got to try this mm. so so good morels are absolutely oh my mouth is watering that looks <laughs> amazing so I, I this video um did decently well and got a lot of feedback but a lot of the feedback was people saying there's only one way to cook morels and that was to you know cut them in half and then dredge them in flour and fry them in butter which i absolutely love doing but this is just another way of cooking morels and also with part of cooking uh, this this video, I found out um, in India and um, Pakistan and like the Himalayas, they call them Gucci mushrooms for some reason. That's the, their, name, their common name for morels is Gucci. And so every time I post this video, I get a bunch of people being like, oh, Gucci mushrooms. And they talk about how, you know, how expensive they are over there. So I think it's a good reminder that like morels grow around the planet. And although you know, the Midwest has this very sort of simplistic way of like putting them in flour and frying them in butter. Cuisines around the world use them. And so that was one of the things I wanted to show with this video a little bit was just be like, you know, they work really well in a lot of different dishes. And particularly the Indian style cream spinach um, is a good one to add mushrooms to because they add a lot of extra fun texture along with the fried cheese. Yeah, definitely. That sounds, that sounds amazing. Uh, do we want to do one more quick video and then we sure. will uh, yeah, when you when you fire off the cream sauce one. All right, cream sauce. Because that's that's a, that's a that's a more classic. And honestly, all I'm doing in this video is basically making um, Julie's, you know, patented amazing cream sauce, um, just with my own little twist. All right, cool. It's coming up. Oh, Eat morels, making a cream sauce. Let's go. I have all these beautiful morels that I harvested last spring from a burn here in California. I'm going to rehydrate them and turn them into this delectable, delectable morel cream sauce. Look at all those beautiful morels. I'm using the greens of my leeks to make a stock. I'm going to rehydrate my morels with my leek stock. So pour hot water over and let them soak for a good 20-30 minutes before I go to cook these. Oh yeah, look at those. Shallots? Those shallots, yep. A little bit of salt, and I'll just let that cook down, get nice and soft before I add the morels. I'm going to strain the morels off of the rehydration liquid, and then chop these up in bite-sized pieces. So here I've got my nice, beautiful rehydrated morels, and the soaking liquid, which is really, really savory and delicious. And I'm just going to give these morels kind of a rough chop. So they're a little bit more bite-sized for my cream sauce. Now that my shallots and leeks are nice and soft, I'm gonna add some morels and cook these off. So I've got a beautiful mixture here of all those rehydrated morels, leeks, and shallots. And now I'm gonna go ahead and deglaze it. I've got some really nice sherry here. I'm gonna pour it in and deglaze the pot with the sherry. 
Now I'm gonna add my rehydrated morel liquid. And this is so much for mommy. <laughs> yeah. Next, I'm gonna add a little pinch of herb Provence. Just a nice little herbal flavor in there, not too much. Then I'm gonna add some good quality local organic heavy cream. And we're just gonna let this cook down. And it's gonna be so tasty. Ooh, yeah, look at the morel cream sauce. That was my favorite way to eat morels, making a cream sauce. The uh, the extra little thing that it, you didn't see on camera there was just just boiling it down, cooking it, reducing it, and um, finishing it with about a tablespoon of Dijon mustard, um, which is a, a trick I very much learned from Julie. Um, so someone asked if I should boil the water you poured it onto the morels. Uh, no, because I already started with like boiling water, and then I also am double cooking it down. So this is a, a thing where everything is, is well cooked. Um, and even if you're like rehydrating a dried morel, you should still cook it after it's been rehydrated. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I'm hungry. Is it dinner time yet? <laughs> well, I use that's, that morel cream sauce is super versatile because you can put it on steak you can put it in pasta. Uh, I think last year after I made that big batch, I ended up putting a bunch in sort of like a stuffed pizza with some lamb and just kind of like folded it over and made like a half calzone pizza stuffed thing. And it was good. My parents ate a bunch. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gordon. Uh, we'll be back with the, another video from you a little bit later. Uh, but I wanted to check in with Spike. We haven't heard anything from him yet. Um, and then we'll be back to Wade uh, to finish up the Koji. Uh, Spike, let's I've see. Been, I'm I've been quiet since I've been watching everybody's stuff. Yeah. How's it so, going? It's going. It's still cold here. We we got snow coming to New England this, this week, so. <laughs> no more uh, else. Yeah, yeah, no more else for another couple months. We'll be lucky to get some mushrooms within by the end of this month. I find my uh, Jeremitra usually at the end of April. So um, it's New England. We're, we're used to it here. But I wanted to talk about the chop challenge that the culinary committee does for NAMA. Yes. So, so since this is a morel special that we're doing in this webinar, I decided to do a video using morels and kind of mimicking exactly what somebody might do um, to enter this contest. So just to mention that there is a prize. Uh, it's a few hundred dollars towards registration and room and board at the big annual NAMA foray that's going to be held um, Halloween weekend this year in Washington, Randall, Washington. So anybody that's not familiar with a chop style challenge, it was a TV show. I'm not sure if it's still on. I have personally never watched it myself, uh, but I've entered these contests online. So the video I made was for an online contest in a cooking with mushrooms group. Um, but similar, similar contest. Um, so to show you here, we have our contest and to let people know we have six ingredients this year, which is going to be mushroom of your choice, miso, cream cheese, maple syrup, parsnip, and potato chips. So in this basket of ingredients, you can do anything you want. You can add any other ingredient, but all six of those ingredients need to be used. So what we're looking for for the contest is one plate that uses all six of those ingredients plus um, and, and submitting to a, a we, the culinary committee, we're going to be looking at all these um, and we will judge these. Um, when we get the recipes, we're gonna be making some of these as well so we can try them to make sure that they're good. Um, so I went over the price, uh, uh, the prizes that are at hand. Uh, there is an application page on the NAMA website. I saw that. Rephrase the six ingredients. And all of this is on the, the NAMA website right now, um, which, which lists the whole uh, contest that we're doing for the scholarship. So it is mushrooms of your choice, miso, cream cheese, maple syrup, parsnip, and potato chips. Uh, so there is a website on the NAMA page at um, uh, NorthAmericanMyco.org for the Culinary Challenge. Um, you can also email the Culinary Arts at NAMyco.org uh, with your submission. So what we're looking for is uh, a dish so we can see this. We want the recipe of all the ingredients and the, and the method that you took to uh, make this. 
And we're also going to need your name and contact information because if you win, we need to find you to tell you that you won. Uh, and just to let you know on the prizes for this, it is for somebody to attend the big NAMA foray. So if you've attended the foray before, um, how do I put this? Um, it's for somebody that's never been to the foray. So if you win and you've been to a NAMA foray before, um, you can do it for your family, you can do it for your friends, or you can pass the prize to the runner up. Uh, this is really to get new people out there to attend the foray at NAMA. Um, so uh, the deadline is midnight, June 1st, Central Time. Um, yeah, well, I think that's all I got for you. All the ingredients in one dish. We got what we need. We got what the winner is. We got who is eligible. Um, and if you do post this to Facebook and Instagram, feel free, but put the hashtag um, NAMA Chopped 2024 so we can see it and we can share it among the group. And uh, that's all I got on, on, on the description of what we're doing. So I've done this video in advance, um, actually using morel mushrooms with the ingredients to, to show people how to go about doing this contest and submitting entries. All right, we got that coming up one second here. Um, here we go. Hello there, and uh, welcome to the Culinary Committee webinar special on morels for this spring season coming up. Uh, I wanted to go over our CHOP challenge, which is going on, and how we go about that and how you can enter um, in the process. If you're unfamiliar with how it works, well, we devised a recipe to show you what we're going to be doing. So for this chopped challenge that I entered, there was five key ingredients. Uh, one was being leeks. There was also clementines, ground pork, Cheetos, and wild mushrooms. And since we were doing a Mortkella uh, special today, I thought I'd use morels here. Uh, disregard the maitake in this photo. I did plan on using that. Um, after the morels reconstituted, I felt that was more than enough mushrooms for the ingredients. So just because this is a chop special and I have to use those five key ingredients doesn't mean I can not use any other ingredient I want. So here to list a few that uh, I'm using for this dish, we're using some mescaline mix, ice, water, Sugar salt, uh, I have demi-gloss, sherry wine, white balsamic vinegar, molasses, mayonnaise, oysters, um, black bean paste, tamari, panko, uh, and those five key ingredients. So today I'm doing three components on this dish. One, we are taking the Cheetos and encrusting the oysters uh, to bake. We're going to be pickling leeks and we're going to be stuffing the oyster shells with a lobster sauce, um, also having candied clementines as a component. So here we're going to be starting the pickled leeks um, as that is one component of this dish. So I have the ingredients I'm using, balsamic vinegar, salt, sugar, water, uh, chilies, basils, clementines, and leeks. So for the candy leeks, while we're prepping leeks, I wanna slice our, um, I'm sorry, not the leeks, the clementines. So I'm going to blanch them very briefly after they're sliced. Uh, this is just hot boiling water. I find that this takes the edge of the tartness uh, you might find in the rye, uh, the rind of citrus fruits. Uh, so just a quick dip in some boiling water and I'm going to remove them into an ice bath to shock them to uh, stop that cooking process. We do this prior to candying them. Uh, as I mentioned, it does take some of that bite off. You might find just using straight, um, raw, uncooked, unblanched citrus fruit for candying. Now, my ice bath here, we're just going to set this aside for later on while we work on some other components of the dish. I just want to make sure that there is uh, no heat to continue cooking these. This is why we ice them. So with more clementines, we're going to grate them because we do want to use some of the zest uh, for this dish. We're going to take the basil. We're going to peel the leaves off, set them aside, and use the stems here. We're going to slice in half our chili peppers and use those. And we're going to trim the leek. So I dis discard the top where it's green. Um, and I like to peel off a few of the layers on the outside. So I make a little slit in the bottom half of the leek that we're using. One thing you notice, I didn't take off the roots in the bulb off this. For the 
finished product of the leak that we're using here, we're going to want to leave that root tip on. This will help keep it intact while we're cutting and also while we're cut, uh, cooking. So here I'm just going to make it uh, into eight slivers. So I'm going to cut it in half just above that base, flip it over, cut that in half, and then I'm going to do the same on the corners for eight nice even pieces. Note that base stays on, makes it so the leaves don't fall apart uh, when we cook them or as we're cutting them. An example on one more right here. I think of having a little brush that you can, uh, you know, with all the tantrums that you have at the end. So here's our finished product. We have about eight or ten of these that we're going to use. Uh, we plan on making a few plates with this dish and this recipe. So I have the leek, basil stems, chili pods, and all the scraps um, of the clementines, the butts from the slices that I used. I cut a few more in half just to throw them into this, and we're recycling that hot water that we uh, blanched the clementine slices in. So we're just going to leave those in there after stirring them briefly for about two minutes. So after that, we'll work on our brine while that's cooking. So I have my white balsamic vinegar. This is sugar or salt. Let me taste it. This is the salt. So we're going to be putting some salt into that vinegar. We're also going to be putting sugar. And a little more salt. And we're going to cut that down with a little bit of water before mis uh, whisking it up. So this all in a matter of two minutes. Um, this is about as cooked as our vegetables uh, that we want to go, our leeks and other components. So we're going to strain that hot liquid out so we can add, add the body that we were cooking into the brine that we just made. Now here I do want to keep the chili pods in the, in the basil. Everything adds flavor as it sits. Although I do look for seeds from the citrus fruit. Clementines are very nice. They're typically seedless. Uh, but you always have to check. I often find one or two um, every, every now and then in a few pounds. Uh, so I do like to keep an eye out for that because this is a step that we can remove the citrus seeds uh, that we don't want in here, which can be uh, damaging to your teeth and nobody likes eating citrus seeds in their food. So we add everything into the brine. We're gonna give it a quick toss and we're gonna stick this in the refrigerator for a latter day. We do wanna do this hours before preparing everything else. Uh, ideally, I do like to let this sit in the fridge overnight. Here I've added a little water um, just to add a little liquid to keep them submerged. And that zest from the clementine that we had on the side, this is the step that we want to stir it in. And, and I will mention again, this is best done the night ahead of time uh, to add maximum flavor to the leeks. So off to the next component, we're going to want to make lobster sauce. Uh, not depicted here is the ground pork, which we'll be starting with, but we do have our black bean paste, our tamari, ginger, garlic, chili, basils, uh, my molasses, and demi-gloss. But before we get started with that, since we're throwing morels in, we're only using dried morels. Um, these are more cultivated landscapes, Morkella in Partuna. Uh, but we do want to reconstitute them from dry, so I just added some sherry wine in and some water. It's about 50-50. We're going to put it in a small pot, and we're going to put it on the stove uh, to bring the liquid up to a heat. Once it comes up to a heat, we can let it simmer. In about 15-20 minutes, you'll notice those dry hard morels are nice and soft and that's what we're looking for this is reconstitution so while those are cooking we have our ground pork and we have a nice hot pan that we're just going to sear it as it browns we're going to stir it and we've taken our garlic ginger and chilies chiced minced and sliced those we're going to add those in after a few minutes we'll notice that our morels are nice and soft so all that liquid that's reduced uh, reconstituting the morels we want to add that into the pot of the ground pork with the garlic, ginger, and peppers we added, and give it a little stir. This liquid will help any pork that sticks from the bottom of the pan. Once that's stirred up, we're gonna add our tamari, black bean paste, demi-gloss, molasses, and I do have some chopped basil here, the leaves that we reserve from the stems. Once we mix those in, we're gonna squeeze uh, clementine to get the juice in a small ramekin, and then we're gonna add a little bit of cornstarch and stir it in with our finger. 
We refer to this as a slurry, and it will help add some consistency to our lobster sauce. Here we can just stir it right in. And then those reconstituted morels, uh, we slice those into little slivers and some more basil, stir that in. And then after that, you can shut that sauce off. And that's our lobster sauce. So from our ingredients, we neglected to show you the oysters. So I did want to give a little demo on how to properly shuck an oyster. Um, they can be a fantastic snack that you can eat raw and utilize many ways. But I notice here I am talking about the shells. So the bottom has a cup shell. And on the top that I have here is more flat. And typically when you get oysters on the half shell, you reserve the cup. So here I have a towel and an oyster shucker. You snap the oyster shucker into, this, into the hinge, uh, is what we call it. And then you can take the oyster shucker and rim around the edge of the shell to peel off that top flat shell. And here we're reserving the liquid from the oyster. All that juice and water that was inside there, we're gonna add to our lobster sauce. So here, let me show you again. I find my nice cup side, which I prefer down, into the towel. Oyster shucker goes in the hinge, wiggle, wiggle. Once it pops, slide, slide the knife, uh, oyster knife around the edge, pop it open, and there's always a little tendon on the top that's connected. You just slice that off, and now you have an oyster on the half shell. And again, don't forget to reserve the juice for this recipe. All right? So since there's shells and sediment, we do want to strain this. And this can go right into that lobster sauce. Um, it doesn't even need to be turned on and stirred. And we've reserved our cup shells, and we've taken our oyster meat and mixed it with mayonnaise and squeezed a clementine to make a citrus mayonnaise that it's going to sit in. So while this is setting and absorbing that flavor, let's get to our breading. We're using our Cheetos. So we're just going to pulse those to a gritty, not powdery form. And then we're going to cut it with some panko to stretch it because I didn't feel one bag of Cheetos would bread all these oysters. So we're using panko breadcrumbs as well. So here I have uh, what we call a breading station. So we're going to a wet dry with these oysters, which are in that citrus mayonnaise. Um, and also with the oysters in that citrus mayonnaise, this is something that can be done ahead and kept in the fridge for a few hours. Uh, that flavor of the acids inside the mayonnaise penetrate that meat a little bit more the longer it is. Um, but anytime more than 30, 40 minutes, you should have no problem. So we want to make sure that the oysters are coated in the mayonnaise and then we remove them and put them into the panko Cheeto mixture. And we really want to coat the outside of these. And since we're using a wet dry breading procedure here, I like to have three pans, one for the wet, one for the dry, and then one for our finished product. You know, this is after our oysters are breaded to what we want. And excuse me using one hand. Um, <laughs> usually I use two hands when I bread things, but I was holding the camera for this. So it is taking a little longer than I thought, but I'm just going now. My, my oysters have their initial dredge, um, and I'm trying my best to keep my hand dry. As we bread things, we do like to have one hand for wet and one hand for dry. Um, so I go through them, pat them down, make sure every crevice in, in the insides is breading. Now, as the breading is coating it, um, you're kind of making a seal, you know, to help lock in those flavors. Now we're going to be baking these. Now, since we are using mayonnaise, which is a oil based and I have pulsated the Cheetos, which uh, seems to have a lot of saturated fat introduced to them as well. I don't feel the need to add any oil or fat on top of this. Um, you're more than welcome to put these in a deep fryer. I felt the oil content with the mayonnaise and the Cheetos itself was enough oil for me, so we decided to bake these in the oven. Now, you don't have to worry about drying uh, breadcrumbs on the outside because the mayonnaise uh, oils on the inside will penetrate that, making it wet to brown, and also that processed Cheeto with the saturated fat um, have its, has its browning tendencies. So here I'm going to throw them in the oven. Oven's about 350, 375. Uh, we're going to cook them for about four or five minutes. And then we can take them out, flip them, and cook them for another four or five minutes. And while those are cooking, our lobster sauce is done. We're going to stuff the half shells with the lobster sauce. And during that halfway point of flipping the oysters, we're going to toss in those to make sure that's nice and hot. So I did neglect to mention how to candy these with the simple syrup. So here I've added uh, water and sugar, um, boiled them briefly, and then transferred them to a rack on a pan and I've thrown them in the oven. 
Now, that oven was on and I shut it off. Uh, just that dry heat uh, will help crisp the clementines. So we've had our leeks that we take out and we twist them in our palms before putting on the plate. So our three components to plate to finish this dish, we're going to put a bed of mescaline greens on the bottom just to help hold those oysters up, which are stuffed with the morel lobster sauce. We have our twisted pickled leek, we have our candied clementines, and we have our fried Cheeto oyster on top. Uh, so that's it for the chop challenge. Using our five ingredients, being creative, uh, using other ingredients we think it would pair. <laughs> a little bit early there, but uh, thank you so much, Spike. That was uh, quite interesting and creative to see how you pulled all of those ingredients together. Yeah, you have to be with these chop challenges, so. Sorry, yeah. Spike. I thought you were talking over the video and not in the video. <laughs> that's the trick. <laughs> All good. That, that's, that's a cool so dish, Spike. That's a very cool dish. Yeah, so hopefully that was some inspiration for people to check out our current challenge and get out there and just go wild, create some really cool stuff for us. All right. Uh, so up next, we are we're gonna go back to Wade. Are you ready to uh, show us some more Koji stuff? Not only that, but I figured out how to turn the speaker onto my phone. So uh -huh. I'd have to like hold it up to my ear like a frittata. Um, so um, let me switch it around. All right, so I took some of the morel shio koji and then the morel shoyu koji that i marinated the ramps in and just made kind of like a stir fry and the you know because it's rice you know, uh, rice flour based it basically turns into a gravy and you're know, free free gravy but it's like the personification of morel and it's a lot of flavors that that you will not have tasted because we don't have enough enzymes in our like palate to get us there so like you're kind of tasting morels for the first time all over again but i'm just doing like a like a simple salad and um i eat like very complicated simple food um and then I picked some some violets, and violets actually go really well with morels, oddly enough. Uh, and then um, I figured out this like rad solvent and alcohol free extraction process, and I made this like morel molasses, and I will drizzle some of that over top it will drizzle wait is that just do you make like a two to one sugar syrup put some morels in and boil it down or is there a more complicated molasses because that looks that looks thick and and full of umami. yeah it's like i'm still trialing it to make sure that it works for all things but it's like the most medicinal content possible within that medium um it's a pure extraction like a uh it's like i've been working on it for two years and hitting the same wall and i've been smacking my head against the wall for literally two years and then i made something else and it it like the outcome of that made me realize like what something that people have been doing for like a long time like that they don't realize that it is an actual extraction process. Um, but yeah, so it's just like a smoky, chocolatey, resiny kind of like molasses and hyper, it's like shelf stable. And I don't know, like I, I've been, I'm going to do a, a, I did a cordycep one and um, the, the result on that was like, People liked it. They said it was like the best thing I'd ever made, which like I was like, oh, okay. Um, 
and I'm going to do a truffle version next just to see like if I can pull maximum like most people don't really know what truffles taste like because the aroma is so strong but there's a lot of like nuttiness and sweetness in them that is kind of like left out just because again the aroma is so uh dominant but um but yeah so that's what i made with just like a uh, spring primavera shio koji morel gravy wow that looks fantastic i i really wish i could eat that right now <laughs> it's, nice. it's like the it has the garlic mustard and um the I, I just use the ramp greens and like one of the cool parts so with the um the show you koji like something else i, I didn't tell you all was like uh you can do basically a um uh like before you put the morels in um you can strain out the rice like effectively what you're doing is just adding like active enzymes to the soy sauce or the tamari but if you want like a more clarified version of this you can strain out the rice and you just throw it into a sock pot um but i prefer to to blend it up and use it as kind of like a hyper mushroom forward flavored soy um like i, I don't mind if it's not clear or a yeah, it's, it's like I know, different people have different preferences, but um, and then in the time that we've chatted, uh, uh the... one more thing before before you um move on um somebody was asking maybe some clarification on how you made that uh the molasses portion, uh, or is that a top secret? Yeah, that's like. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I just wanted to show like uh, I talked to Krista and uh, about it and uh, Trent asked if it could be made with morels and I, I did morels. So, um, yes, it can. And, you know, I will be sending some out his way to, to render it on the Caesar. But. Um, uh, but yeah, I just, I just use that. You, know, you can use like. um I'm trying to think like how you could make it with um you could do like jaggery or something like that mm, okay. like you're going to do like a, a accelerated like a, a home kitchen version but this is like not a home kitchen version mm. um anyway like so the the shio koji in the time it's become more and more like por porridge and after about the second or third day the rice will be like fully permeated with the water and then that's when the magic really starts to happen that's when you get um but like ultimately this will turn into literally just kind of like a sweet porridge uh, a sweet salty porridge that um whatever you add this to will be a flavor powerhouse nice nice um i see a question here um before we move on um What's the someone uh, Donna Kurt asks? What's the risk of botulism with dried morels or truffles in koji fermentation? I I don't know. Um, I've because it's like enzymatically breaking them down. It would only be like if your starting mushrooms were problematic to begin with. But like I've never personally, I've not had any problem. I've never gotten sick. Um, but anything I add it to is then cooked. Like I'm not just like like any any mushroom shio koji or shoyu koji. I'm cooking that medium. Like I'm adding it to a sauce or. Um, I think you know. Gordon wants to chime in here. So food safety wise, Clostridium, the bacteria that causes botulism, um, can only grow above pH 4.5. I don't know what the pH of those things are, but there's a good chance often fermentation lowers the pH to a safe level. Um, it also can only grow like in uh, conditions where there's no oxygen. And since you're keeping this in oxygenated condition, developing clostridium is very unlikely. If you were to like take this mixture and can it, then you'd have a risk of botulism. But also right. like as Wade said, 
there's you're starting with like dried morels and often you end up cooking it again so there's like very low risk of something like botulism in this don't like take a bunch of meat and can it and do a bad job that's how you get botulism <laughs> you know but if you stay in lower ph and fermented foods generally it's it's a non-issue thanks gordon yeah I've, I've never seen like koji spam for example uh because like i don't even know if that's possible because it would still be digesting it in that medium you could definitely digest it, but then you would probably um, pasteurize it. And then it would, you know, you'd still right, have right. had the enzymatic input, but you no longer have like live culture in a, in a jar. But someone else to get uh, Koji parts from, it's a mutual friend of um, Gordon and myself, but it's uh, Shared Cultures. It's on the West Coast and um, Kevin and Eliana are like, they're, great people they've been making stuff uh they have really fantastic miso like their chanterelle miso is top notch um i prefer to buy theirs instead of making my own um but yeah that's another like really great and yeah they, they, they use top quality ingredients and um any way i can support them i absolutely will because there's not many people they're like making great products with koji like consistently great because it's you know hard to all the hassle stuff and the health department never makes it easy for you but um but yeah if there's any other questions sorry about the phone thing like i i'm murphy's law so like if something's going to happen it's going to happen to me um but uh uh, we have one more question uh, from Donna. Uh, she says, after you make the koji marinade, do you refrigerate it or leave it on the counter? Use yes, it up refrigerate. I, I, I put that in the in the chat. Like after it matures, refrigerate. Okay. Nice. Um, and I think, uh, Wade, when you put it in the chat i think you only put that to the hosts and panelists um instead of everyone oh. <laughs> of course <Okay. laughs> oops i i'm also I'm answering questions to the hosts and panelists sorry everyone oops <laughs> all good uh technology um my partner mike here is going to copy and paste all of your um comments wade and put them in the chat for you okay thanks mike so i put all the ratios and all the um uh cool like, um i'm trying to think of like places that people can go that have great like friends of mine have written like uh koji alchemy is a good book for um learning how to kind of like apply koji to the home kitchen or to your restaurant that's, that's uh, but if you're jeremy reading, umansky's book right yeah rich Rit yeah, jeremy, jeremy and, okay um there's another one like for people that want to grow their own koji. It's called Koji for Life, and it's a um, uh, it's a Japanese author, and it's uh, translated into English. But it's like his family's been making koji for like seven generations, and it's very bare bones. Like you're not going to have a whole bunch of like how to use it, but it will be um, it, it's it's the best for people that are like myco uh minded um like it's not just ratios like it's explaining more of like what is going on um whereas a lot of the other books they're just more like recipe based and not like uh uh technique um but uh yeah, and like the Noma book of fermentation, that's another one that a lot of people reference. But I see that book as more a art book because it's like that's what they're able to do at Noma, whereas my kitchen does not have four hundred thousand dollars worth of you know freeze dryers and exactly. Um, yeah, you know, so it's it's neat to know what's possible, but don't expect what you make from their cookbook to like happen the exact same way because then it's like their environment the ingredients they're using like there's so many different matrices that 
Um, yeah, but I think it's really neat what they have done with it, but I don't use that as a, um, I don't have the expectation that what I make is going to be identical to what they make. Um, it's just like one of those, like no whammies fingers mm -hmm. crossed. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you, Wade. That was a fantastic uh, share and inspiring and a great uh, introduction to Koji and things that you can make with it. So I think we have, um, we have one more video from Gordon. Uh, we can pull that up in just a moment here. Uh, you're on mute. Thanks. I was gonna say it's a, it's a little bit more of a classic um, cooking method, but it's it's exciting and it's I was sort of this was a summer one because I had squash blossoms around. But. All right, and coming up one second. Here we go. Get the sound on. Hunger! Holy cow! Cut it off the base. Woo wow! Look at all these morels. I'm gonna show you how I deep fry squash blossoms and morel mushrooms. These are stuffed with a mixture of ricotta cheese, caramelized shallots, and jalapenos, along with some Parmesan. A batter made of cornmeal, all-purpose flour, and some porcini powder. Get it nice and coated. And go down with the squash blossom. And go down with the morel. Squash blossom is nice, golden brown, delicious. And I give the morel just a little bit longer to make sure it cooks all the way through. I'm going to carefully remove my morel here, let it drain for just a second. And right as these come out of the fryer, I'm going to put a little bit of salt on them. Whoa, look at these morels and these squash blossoms. That is some tasty stuff. Let's give the squash blossom a taste. Mmm, wow. That's creamy savory, crunchy. That's so good. Next, I'm going to try this crispy stuffed morel. Oh, oh my god. Meaty mushroom texture from the morel. Really mild mushroom flavor. Tons of umami. Mmm. That is just out of this world good. Um, whoa, look at the size of this hunger. Holy so you can you can stuff morels with anything, but cheese is is pretty classic. As is um, like a force meat mixture. So if you're to blend up, you know, some pork or shrimp, and you know you could you can do sort of more traditional Western flavors, or you could add some Eastern flavors with like white pepper and a uh, little MSG, a little soy, you know, stuff like that, and pipe that inside of a morel. Usually with a morel, when you do that, you want to poach it first to sort of set the texture because otherwise they'll shrink a lot. Um, for the cheese one, it was okay to stuff them while they were raw. Um, but again, if you do it with meat, the meal gets squeezed out when the morel gets small. Uh, and and when you do fry something like that, it's important. You know, morels, like I said, can be toxic when they're raw. So you want to cook them like for several minutes at least. Um, they're not a kind of mushroom that you want to like put in the pan and just like zhuzh for a second. You want to actually give them like a solid five minutes or more in the pan to, to cook and blow off any of the toxic volatile that's in the mushroom. Um, there's one other note on eating morels is they're delicious, but if you eat a lot of morels and you have a lot of alcohol, um, some people's body, and I've experienced this before, I ate a lot of mushrooms and drank a lot. And if I'd done one or the other, I would have been fine. But instead I woke up at like four in the morning and throw up, uh, threw up. So it, you know, it can happen and just be aware that sometimes there's like mushroom alcohol interactions. Um, so it's always a good idea to moderate your intake of both. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I I'm starving, but um, <laughs> this is this is awesome. So I want to open this up to any questions. Um, actually, wait. Before that, I wanted to announce or talk a little bit about some upcoming um upcoming events. Um, again, the, the CHOP challenge that Spike mentioned, um, but also um, we are, myself and my partner Mike here, um, can kind of see him. Uh, 
<laughs> Lord. <laughs> Uh, we are heading up the NAMA regional in Arizona this year, um, and it is very culinary focused. Um, I think he's going to show it or, or just gonna link. put a link into yeah. the comments here for you guys. Um, but um, yeah, we are, you know, up in Arizona and it's, you know, you don't really think of Arizona as having a lot of mushrooms, but there are mushrooms in Arizona, and we are going to be doing some awesome culinary stuff, um, tasting menus, multi-course dinners, um, you know, flavors of Arizona. So that registration is going to be opening up on, on April 15th. So definitely get some friends together and come out and join us. Um, and then after that, uh, the, the annual foray is going to be happening in the Pacific Northwest, uh, right around Halloween, I think October 31st through November 3rd. That's also going to be an awesome, uh, event that the culinary committee is also going to be having a presence at. So yeah. And if there are, um, let's see, any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we will chat about them. Um, anyone here, I think this is probably what uh, Gordon was talking about, um, says, was that just morels or any type or any mushroom? And yeah. There, there was one question about are dark morels better tasting than like blonde morels? Mm -hmm. And generally what I've heard from people is that blonde morels are sort of the best tasting ones. Um, I think the the black and sort of gray morels, which are both, you know, associated with burns can be pretty good, but I do find, um, so there's what are called natural morels, ones that come out without a burn. And then there's burn morels, which come out after a burn. And there's a lot of different species in both these categories. But generally, in my experience, I found that the natural morels do taste a little bit better. The burn morels can be kind of ashy and kind of gritty. So they take a little more cleaning, but then you kind of wash off a little bit more, maybe the flavor. Um, the few times that I've tried blonde morels, they've been absolutely fantastic, but I don't find them very often because they're not as common. Uh, out here, the landscape morels, uh, comparative to like the blonde and the blacks, don't have a lot of flavor. And in general, I think the landscape morels are what they've figured out how to cultivate. So a lot of people, the rub with cultivated morels is maybe you can grow them, but they're just not going to taste as good as wild ones. Um, but drying a morel can massively enhance and intensify the umami flavor. So morels and like porcini and shiitake are all mushrooms that when you dry them out, get a much stronger umami hit uh, than, the, than the fresh version. And when I cook morels, I really like to blend both like fresh and dried together. So you're getting sort of the best of the texture from the fresh and the best of the umami from the dried. Um, but it's it's really cool. Like seeing what Wade did has like got my brain working in all kinds of different directions because I want to use like the dried stuff to make a shio koji thing, but then use that to do something. Maybe you could blend it and turn it like add it as the liquid in a batter for like deep frying a morel or something like that. Be really cool. Then put that on top of a steak and, you know, maybe put a Cheeto crusted oyster beside it and do a little surf and turf kind of thing. Who knows? Uh, for Spike, I, I'm happy to make, uh, substrate, like use the, the Cheeto substrate and send you some, <laughs> some Koji Cheeto, uh, flour. that was the first time I ate Cheetos in 30 years, but just because of the recipe. And that's all I ate from that dish because I don't eat meat. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. You don't need to go out of your way for the Cheeto substrate just for me. <laughs> We we did this contest. It was actually Umansky, like there were like ten of us, and we had to make we had to use uh, trash food as like your know, junk food as the substrate, and people did those like blue takis, <laughs> just like it was a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. Uh, there's a question here. Um, do we from Donna again? Do we know what the toxin is in? uncooked morels that causes poisonings or GI issues? Is it gyomitrin? Yeah, it's it's the same kind of thing. It's it's a metabolized system monomethylhydrazine. So it's the same hydrazine toxin that's in Gerometra and Helvella and Morchella. Um, 
Is there all ascomite seeds? I think a lot of ascomite seeds when raw contain small amounts of that. So it's also a reason why with any ascomite seed, you should always probably cook it and not consume them raw, except for truffles. But that's kind of the exception to that rule. And in general, you should probably cook most of your mushrooms um, because although there are a lot of mushrooms you could consume raw without ill effect, many of the common edible mushrooms that we eat all the time, like oyster mushrooms, chicken of the woods, shiitake, morels, are all things that if you ate them raw can make you pretty sick. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I do want to say that I had um, Gyromitra Montana mm -hmm. last year, and I was very surprised at how tasty that was. Yeah, uh, it's good. Yeah, but, we, but, so, oh, go ahead. we were looking for morels up in northern Arizona, and it was just a bit too early in the season for them up there. And uh, but the gyromitras were just everywhere, just huge ones. And so we cooked those up and I was like, oh, well, I'm pleasantly surprised. They're actually pretty good. Yeah, they're not bad. I mean, verpa are pretty good when you cook them. Again, those can have an alcohol interaction effect. So be careful eating verpa with alcohol. Um, I've, I know you've done it and I've done it, like played around with Helvella because those are kind of like the gyromitra. Um, but again, they have a little bit more of that uh, toxin in them. So what you usually want to do is you want to boil them first before you put them into another dish and also boil them like outside or in a well-ventilated space because that toxin is, you know, volatile. Uh, the the bigger, browner, sort of less densely folded gyromitra around the world seem to be edible, whether it's Montana or Carolina or like there's several different species that all fall in sort of this safe clade of gyromitra. Um, but again, people get really confused between like what's edible, what's not edible. And then it's complicated because in Europe and a lot of Scandinavian countries, they will like take the esculenta and the infula, the darker, more toxic gyromitra, and they'll like double boil them. So they'll put them in two successive changes of water and boil off the toxin and then eat them. And a lot of people say that those are really excellent. But even with that practice some people die from eating them every year and there was like a recent cluster of like ALS patients that they found in like the Swiss Alps who'd all long term consumed those kinds of mushrooms so I for me I wouldn't bother trying to boil those until they're safe and especially with even the gyrometra that are safe I cook them extra long just to be sure so that means like doing a dry sear to really get all the water out adding a little bit of fat slowly browning with some salt and then also doing a step where you deglaze and add some liquid and you're probably at least like 15, 20 minutes in a pan. Like I said, this is not the kind of thing you want to just like flash over the heat and eat. You really want to cook them down. Um, and mushrooms aren't going to lose anything texturally. And if anything, a longer cook time is just going to like intensify their flavor. All right. And crisp them up. I mean, yeah. Um, oh, also fact, one, one, one more thing. Sorry. Uh, common name, lore chills. No one has a common name from Jerry Metro. So call them if you want. If someone really wants in the common name, some people call them beefsteaks, which I hate. Some people call them turban mushroom, which I also hate. Lorchel is a German name for Jerry Metro. Oh, very cool. Um, uh, speaking of that, it looks like um, somebody said, Rodney says, have you ever heard morels called dry land fish? Apparently it's because of the fish outline appearance when cut in half. I have. I love it. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's exactly right. It looks like a little fish with a tail when you slice them in half. Great common name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 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 as per like the landscape morels not having as much flavor, those would be ones that I would uh, use Koji inputs on because it, you know it's an enzyme. It's, it's pre digesting them. So like you'll be able to pull more out of them that our bodies might not be able to like synthesize, but the enzymes absolutely can rip through them. Like a good example is uh, the um, a kind of truffle that's about to become available. It's like the Italian summer black truffle that they're not really known as having as much aroma or as much. Um, but when you make shiokoji with them, it's every bit as good as like a paragord, if not better in like the context that they're nuttier and you like pull a lot more of the flavor out of them that you wouldn't normally be able to taste. Um, but the, the ones that don't have as much flavor, like I'd be interested to see like what Koji could do to um, reverse that. 
Yeah. Um, so many different uh, things that we can do. Um, let's see. We have, oh yeah, we didn't see this question. Are burn morels carcinogenic? Um, what do you think, Gordon? Would they be, I don't think so, right? I mean, again, hydrazines can cause like, you know, acute short-term neurological symptoms and then potentially in a, like a long-term sense, they might be carcinogenic or lead to like neurodegenerative disease. But if you thoroughly cook them properly, there's, I, as far as I know, there's absolutely no danger posed by morels. And I, like a burn morel, again, if you're worried about like the ash, then it's just a matter of cleaning it. And or what gen it, oh. you think it would be like uptaking that into the mushroom itself? So, so the the stuff that's carcinogenic is the, um, I, what are they called? The, um, it's the carcinogenic, like, breakdown black stuff. I'm spacing on the name of, like, it's amine something or other. It's the same thing that happens when you, like, barbecue everything. And so heterocyclic amines, that's it. So those those are carcinogenic. But actually, white rot fungi, particularly morels, have the enzymes to break those things down. Um, so okay. no, their mycelium basically detoxifies they're less carcinogenic than like smoked ribs, you know, sorry to say, oh. but brisket's carcinogenic. <laughs> Any form of really high heat cooking could potentially, you know, it's take, take a grain of sand. Everything is sun is cancer. Oxygen is cancer. You know, getting old is cancer. Um, you know, you, you got to live your life, but. Yeah. And I'm going to eat morels. <laughs> Gosh, darn right. <laughs> For sure um let's see what else we got here in the chat um hydrazine and common morels uh yes we went through that um yeah right all the ascomycetes have the have some hydrazine in there um morels do mm -hmm. christine says that morels do not have any hydrazines in them I'm I'm looking for a reference right now. It's hard because like there's not a really good systematic evaluation. Um, from what I've read, there is still a small amount, and again, it's locked up as like an inactive compound rather than an active hydrazine. So again, that makes the chemical analysis really different. Um, but still, you should cook your morels thoroughly. I don't know for a fact that what makes raw morels toxic is the hydrazines, but it sort of follows that it would be that because a lot of ascos do contain small amounts of them. Um, Either way, cook a morel, regardless of what the mechanism of toxicity would be. Sounds like a good idea. All right. Um, let's see. It looks like somebody can't copy the chat. Um, uh, put their email address in here, and then I'll send it to them. It's on there. That one, yep. All the way at the bottom, right there. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So I think unless there's any other questions, um, I mean, I'm like now itching to get out to the mountains and I know Arizona, we've already got uh, several folks, um, friends of ours uh, in the Arizona Mushroom Society who are finding morels already, almost like basketfuls, I think. Um, so it's happening. Uh, I think California is a little bit, eh, it's a little, still too cold, but um, getting there. Any um, uh, ending thoughts, Wade or Spike? Mm -hmm. Spike's website. I just, I just, I don't have a website. Well, technically, I do. Um, it's Spike's a fun guy. It's a, it's a square site where I offer some classes on cooking and uh, certification. I have a dinner on Amanita, uh, but I think the question was, was my YouTube channel. Uh, it's the Rhode Island Amanita series, and that has individual speech. I got a lot of videos on there. Um, to me, that, that's specifically on Amanita in general, not on a morels like this special is all about. So just to answer that question. All right. Thanks. Um, I do see a question about uh, what elevation morels in Arizona. So that's... Uh... <laughs> Gonna steal our spots. Uh, no, so we have we have a couple of different kinds here. So it, I'm I'm gonna be blurry, but um, 
So around 6,000 and above is where you're going to find a lot of good ones. But also we do have some low elevation morels here in the Verde Valley. And those usually start popping first. And those are where you're going to find your naturals, your blonde morels. And then mostly everything else you're going to find at 6,000 or above. You're really going to looking for those uh, burn morels. Uh, we do have naturals up there as well, but that's really the best bet up the like 6,000 feet. It's going to be the burn morels. Awesome. Don't give away our stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, awesome. Yeah, people finding them in North Carolina mountains in Boise, Idaho today. That's exciting. It is definitely uh start of the season. I know um looking forward to going to Shasta later on in the season and hopefully finding some up there. Um let's see. Uh Sergi is asking, is anyone testing burn morels for the presence of hexavalent chromium? Uh Gordon, no, let, let me refer to the doctor in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea, baby. <laughs> Again, it's really difficult to do that kind of natural product testing because like some of it would be like, where was the burn? What was there? What is the previous site history? All that kind of stuff. Um, mushrooms in general can concentrate anything as a bioavailable, like biomagnification mm -hmm. kind of thing. So if you're worried about mining in certain areas then maybe it's wiser to not go out um but i know it's tricky because in a lot of countries you may not know the history of the land and you can have flooding that moves stuff like hicks and chromium around i think that's a, a byproduct of is it gold mining or just like any any mining process but it's gnarly yeah yeah uh i mean that's kind of a an issue with all foraging is like you know you don't oh really it's oh it's a fire retardant yeah okay yeah that i don't know but it sounds like trend roads cool well i think we are at our time for today um i think this was an awesome discussion with all of you and it's been an absolute pleasure to hang with you all for a little while tonight and talk about some of some of the i don't know i would say best tasting mushrooms um and thank you everyone for joining us tonight it's been awesome uh if anybody else has anything to say. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties, but now oh, I know you. how to not screw it up next time. You rocked it. <laughs> All right, have a good night, everyone, and thank you so much. Bye.